it is a great pleasure to be here. It, is, uh, it was a full week. I was here since Monday, and every day was a very full program. But I uh, so much appreciate this country and its people. Uh, you are very sincere and loving and just wonderful people. And I thank you for inviting me to this country. I thank you for your hospitality. I was asked to talk to you today about livestock and climate. Now, I am a scientist at the University of California, Davis, and I study the impact of animal agriculture on the environment, particularly on air quality and climate. I quantify how much emissions are given off from livestock and livestock systems and how to mitigate emissions, how to minimize emissions, and that's a hot topic. Today, I will start talking a little bit about what causes, green, what causes warming of our planet. Uh, I will talk about greenhouse gases and about one greenhouse gas in particular. And that greenhouse gas is methane. And the reason why I talk about methane is because that's the most important greenhouse gas for animal agriculture. And it is a very important gas for Uruguay. It's extremely important to get the methane calculations right because about 70%, 70, of all greenhouse gases in Uruguay come from agriculture. So, and the majority of those greenhouse gases are methane. So it's very important to get the methane story right. So I'm on Twitter. If you're on Twitter, follow me, please. I'll follow you back. I want to start with this slide here. This slide shows um, the sun radiating down solar beams to the surface of the Earth, and normally, that solar radiation and the heat contained therein would be reflected back into space if there weren't the so-called greenhouse gases, gases such as CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and others effectively form a blanket over our atmosphere. And this blanket keeps the heat that comes from the sun in our atmosphere. This is actually a very important function. Without greenhouse gases, we could not live on Earth. It would be too cold. So we need greenhouse gases. We need this blanket to keep us warm, so to say. What we don't need is too many greenhouse gases. The blanket is now getting too thick because human activity is putting too many greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. This is the link between greenhouse gases and the warming of our planet. When greenhouse gases are compared to one another, there are mainly three CO2 carbon dioxide methane and nitrous oxide, then people use a unit called global warming potential, or GWP100. GWP simply says that methane is much more potent in trapping heat from the sun than CO2. Okay, if you use this so-called matrix, GWP100, you get the impression that methane is simply a very powerful, a much more powerful CO2. And while that's true, while methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas, there are additional nuances. There is a second part of the story that is oftentimes not understood or not told. But I will tell you that today. So remember this GWP100 is a unit to compare emissions of methane and nitrous oxide to those of CO2. So let's say you have a farm and the farm produces 10 tons of methane. Then all you need to do is multiply 10 tons from your farm times this factor, 28, and that would be 280 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. That's how that works. It's just a factor to convert everything to CO2 equivalent emissions. This slide here, I think, is a very important one. It is the so-called global methane budget. In contrast to other greenhouse gases, methane is not just produced by things such as fossil fuel production and use, agriculture, biomass, wetlands, and so on. Methane is not just produced, but methane is also destroyed. There are sinks for methane. If you look at all the sources in the world producing methane, all the sources add up to 558 558 teragrams in the world. This is normally where the story stops when it's reported in the media. But 
I promised you an important nuance, and that nuance is that there are things that amount to 548. So sources, 558, things, 548, and that leaves the balance of 10 teragrams. So it is very important to understand that methane is not just produced, but methane is also destroyed. I call methane the fast and furious greenhouse gas. Furious because it's potent in trapping heat, but fast because methane is also destroyed. And that means a methane molecule has a very short lifespan. When it's in the air, it takes about 10 years and then it's destroyed. The other greenhouse gases are not. So methane is destroyed, and you see underneath this, this large arrow pointing down, sink from chemical reactions in the atmosphere. And that means that there are molecules in the air that once they meet methane, they kill it. And that on average happens around 10 or 12 years, after 10 or 12 years. And this is really important because it's, it makes methane different from other greenhouse gases. You see here that CO2, once it's in the air, stays there for a thousand years. So when you drive your car and you burn the gasoline, then the resulting CO2 stays in the atmosphere for 1,000 years. Meaning, any time you have ever burned gasoline or oil or coal, the resulting CO2 is still there. If you burn gas on Monday, it will be there for 1,000 years. And additional to what you burned the week prior, and the month prior, and the year prior, and the decade prior, and in addition to what your parents and grandparents burned. Okay? This gas stays for a thousand years, but methane does not stay for a thousand years. Methane is both produced and destroyed. Please remember. And because of it, it has a very short lifespan of 10 years, 10 to 12 years. 10 to 12 years is the length of time methane is in the atmosphere. That's why I call it the fast and furious. I will now walk you through the so-called biogenic carbon cycle. This is the cycle that describes where the carbon that becomes methane, where that carbon comes from, and whether or not cattle and other livestock add new and additional carbon to the atmosphere, leading to new and additional warming of our planet. And I will explain also how carbon from livestock is different versus carbon from other sources such as fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas. It all starts with what plants need to live. Plants need sunlight, water, and a source of carbon. And the plants take the source of carbon from the atmosphere. That's CO2. So the carbon that plants need, plants that our animals eat, that carbon comes from the atmosphere. During photosynthesis, it goes into plants. And then plants make that carbon into cellulose or into starch, carbohydrates. And then our livestock comes along and eats the plant material. The microbes in the rumen of these animals digest the carbohydrates. And in the process, the animal belches out some methane. Here you see the methane. Methane is CH4. That's the chemical formula for methane. The question is, is this carbon in the methane? Is that new carbon added to the atmosphere? Is this new carbon added to the atmosphere? And the answer is, no, it's not new carbon. It originated right here. This carbon molecule here is not new. It came from the atmosphere, from atmospheric CO2. It changed its form. And while it's methane, it does have this heat trapping ability, okay? That is why we want to reduce methane. But a constant source of methane, a constant source of methane, for example, a constant cattle herd produces constant amounts of methane because that gas is both produced and destroyed. And a constant herd of cattle, a constant source of cattle does not add new additional carbon to the atmosphere. It recycles existing carbon. But that does not mean that we just don't care about methane. It means that we want to keep it stable or preferably reduce it. 
What we don't want to do over time is increase it. So in Uruguay, you have 12 million cattle today, beef cattle. 10 years ago, you had how many? 12 million. 20 years ago, you had how many? 12 million. You have constant cattle, but you have cut your sheep herd from, what, 20-something million to now 6-something million. So a drastic reduction of the sheep herd. Overall, in Uruguay, your livestock has not gone up for methane. It has not been stable, but it's probably going down with respect to methane. The worst case is that it would be stable, but it's not going up. And that's important when we characterize the impact of your livestock industry on warming. Remember this, if you have constant methane, you have constant warming caused by these animals. If you have increasing methane, that's a problem. That's a lot of additional warming, but you don't have that here. And if you manage to decrease methane, then something miraculous happens, which is that you're pulling warming from the atmosphere. You are actually reducing warming if you reduce methane. And that makes agriculture a potential solution to the climate change issue. Agriculture and forestry are the only two sectors in society that can actually have a positive impact on warming, meaning you can reduce emissions of methane and that reduces warming. So back to my biogenic uh, uh, carbon cycle, atmospheric CO2 goes into carbohydrates from plants, becomes methane, and then that methane meets um, another molecule called a radical and destroys it and makes it back into atmospheric CO2 where it came from. And that is a biogenic carbon cycle. It takes about 10 to 12 years for this to happen. How is this cycle, this biogenic carbon cycle around livestock, similar or different from important other sources of greenhouse gases? The number one being fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are oil, coal, and gas. Fossil fuels are nothing else but pure carbon that was originally plants and animals, such as dinosaurs, that died a long, long time ago. They died, decayed, fossilized, and accumulated underground in vast amounts. And over the last 70 years, humans have taken about half of all that fossil carbon out of the ground. What did we do with that fossil carbon? We burned it. So where's that carbon now? It's in the atmosphere. So when we take fossil carbon out of the ground and we burn it, then we put that carbon from down there up there. That's not a short-lived cycle. That is a one-way street. Does that make sense? And here's the direct contrast of the two. So first of all, this is fossil, fossil uh, carbon here. So this is uh, oil, coal, gas. We're extracting it. Uh, we are then burning it with cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships, factories, and we are putting new and additional CO2 into the atmosphere. This is what happens with fossil fuels. And here's the, the direct contrast. Fossil fuels are nothing other than ancient carbon that was in the ground for a very long time. We are extracting it from the ground, we are burning it, and we are putting new and additional CO2 into the atmosphere that causes new and additional warming every time. Every time we burn fossil fuel, that causes new and additional warming. And that carbon stays in the air for a thousand years. On the livestock side, the light is a little bright here, so you can't see everything, but on the livestock side, you have this atmospheric CO2, which makes it during photosynthesis into our plants, the plants our animals eat. Some of that carbon stays above ground in our grasses and animals eat it, but the majority of the carbon from atmospheric CO2 does not stay above. It goes below ground into the roots. And from there, microbes pick it up and store it in the ground, a process called soil carbon sequestration. Really important. Healthy soils, ladies and gentlemen, store approximately 30%, 3-0, of all human-caused carbon and lock it in the ground. Soils are very important. We have to treat soils with great respect. We should disrupt soils as little as possible to keep the carbon in the ground. In my opinion, for Uruguay, it is extremely important that you get a really good feel for how much 
soil carbon sequestration occurs, that you quantify it because that is an important sink, an important sink. To me, a very important research area for a country like Paraguay, uh, it's like Uruguay. Sorry, I've been to Paraguay too. So. Um, so you have soil carbon sequestration, but then of, of course you also have animals that eat the above ground vegetation. Uh, in their rumen they produce methane, that methane is belched out, but 10 years later converted back into CO2. So I hope everybody sees that there is a very different flow of carbon. Uh, fossil fuel is a one-way street, carbon, and biogenic uh, carbon is a circular, a circular kind of short-lived uh, situation. So I don't want to bore you with too much detail, but uh, I just wanted to point out that the way we quantify methane currently using this old unit GWP100, the way we quantify it currently is, uh, is under a lot of uh, criticism. And the reason why it's under a lot of criticism is because the way we quantify methane currently does not account for the fact that methane is not just produced but also destroyed. And if you don't account for that, then it makes methane look much worse than it is. Methane is not a, not a benign gas. It is a gas we seek to reduce. But it is very important that we use the right way of quantifying its impact on warming. Because if we hold methane stable, then we don't add additional warming. If we reduce methane, if we reduce methane, then we are pulling carbon from the atmosphere, much as if we were to plant forests that also reduce carbon, right, during photosynthesis. So I'm not here to tell you methane doesn't matter. I'm here to tell you, in my opinion, methane is a major opportunity because if we manage methane and reduce it, then we are part of a climate solution because we can reduce warming. Only agriculture and forestry can do that. No other sector of society can. So I'm telling you, don't be afraid of the whole climate discussion, the methane discussion. Change the way you think about it. Think about losing methane as losing money because what you feed to a cow or to a sheep or so, about 10% of the energy you feed to these animals gets lost as methane with no benefit to you and with an environmental burden associated to it. You don't want to lose methane from the animal. You also don't want to lose methane from the animal's manure. If you reduce methane, you reduce financial losses and you, of course, do what's right for the environment. The question is, can we reduce methane in any major way? And the answer to that is a very clear yes. In California, where I live and work, we have very strict laws. One of them mandates a 40% reduction, 40 40% reduction of methane to be achieved by the year 2030, so very soon. At first, our farmers were very skeptical and scared. They said, how in the world can we reduce methane by 40%? Our animals will always belch. Their manure will always produce methane. What was very uplifting to me was to see that our policymakers did something very smart. They said, yes, we want to reduce methane by a lot, but we want to achieve that by helping our farmers financially to make these reductions possible. So the state of California worked hand in hand with our farming community to put in technologies to reduce methane. I give you one example, dairies. California is a very strong dairy state. We are producing 20% of all milk in the United States. You see here a dairy. Um, so this dairy has about 1,000 cows. And normally, this year would be the place where the manure would be stored in an open fashion. This is called a lagoon. So normally, a manure lagoon is open and the gases go into the air. Now, they are covering the lagoons, and you can see this here. They are covering the lagoons, and you see how the plastic, how the cover is bulging out. The gases that come from the manure are called biogas, and 60% of that biogas, 6-0, 60% of that biogas is methane. And methane has a lot of energy in it. You could burn the biogas and make power from it. 
electricity. But that's not what our farmers do. Our farmers are taking the biogas from the animal manure. They're taking the biogas and convert that biogas into renewable natural gas, which is a fuel for vehicles, for large vehicles, semi-trucks and buses. And the state of California appreciates this pathway from dairy biogas to transportation fuel as the best, the most carbon negative fuel type there is. So we, we already had over 100 large dairies doing this. This is not cheap, by the way, but the state helped pay for it. Several, you know, dozens of dairies have done this, and this one technology alone has already reduced the methane footprint of California dairies by 25%. Of all public investments in California to reduce methane, the dairy industry received 3% of all money, 3%. But those 3% of public investments led to a 30% reduction of methane in the state of California. 3% of public investments led to 30% of methane reductions in the state of California. Now that's a great success story. Because if you reduce methane by so much, you are pulling carbon here, and that generates what's called negative warming. Negative warming is a fancy word for cooling. If you reduce methane by a lot, you're pulling carbon from the air, which has a negative warming effect. And that reduction of methane can counteract other greenhouse gases, getting dairies to become what we call climate neutral, meaning these dairies in a few years will not contribute to any additional warming of our planet. And if these dairies go beyond climate neutrality, then they are net reducing warming and they can sell these credits to other industries like Shell, BP, BMW. They are already buying carbon credits from dairy industry players in California. We have a functioning market, a carbon market in California, where people can now financially benefit from reducing greenhouse gases. This is one of the examples in the world. It's definitely an example for the United States. California is oftentimes the first place. Very soon it will happen all over the United States. In my opinion, you will also, at some point in the, in the I hope not so far future, have a carbon market. And don't be afraid of that. View this as an opportunity. This is not a liability. It is an opportunity if you do it right, if you view a reduction of greenhouse gases the way it should be, you could benefit from it on all accounts. And I think this is really important to you because 70% of all greenhouse gases in this country are agriculture related and the majority of that are methane related. Okay? So reducing that gas will become very important. But I think that you are in very good hands. You have excellent scientists. You have excellent industry associations. You have groups that are working together. You have ministries that are working together. I have been all over the world, I promise you, but in most places where I go, a Ministry of Agriculture, a Ministry of the Environment, they go like this. Not so much here. I see different agencies working with each other, different ministries working with each other, and a nation of people that says, we need agriculture. Agriculture is the backbone of this nation. We need to work with our farmers in order to achieve the objectives we want. So that to me is really great. So I told you in California we have uh, quite a few of these digesters here. These digesters, these covered lagoons have already reduced 2.2 million metric tons of greenhouse gases, which amounts to 25% of the dairy sector. This industry has to reduce 40%. In only three years, they have already received 25, over halfway. They're over halfway where they need to go. So I now will talk to you about um, something um, that is near and dear to my heart, namely the human, the human side of things, uh, the global side of things. What you see on this slide here, year 1750 to 2050, is uh, the development of human population in the world. You see on the z-axis here the total human population in billions. So I'm a little over 50 years. When I was a little boy, we were right here at 3 billion people. Today we are here at 7.6 billion people, 
or 7.8. And by the time I'm an old man, we will be at 9.5 billion people. Ladies and gentlemen, throughout my lifetime, human population on this planet will have tripled. Three times more people on our planet during our lifetime. But we don't have three times more natural resources to feed these people. We will not have three times more water, three times more land, three times more fertilizer. So what does that mean? What does that mean? That means two things. First, we need to make the best use of our natural resources. Whatever grows in our countries, make the best use of land to produce food, first. And secondly, become as efficient as you can. Because if we don't do that, then we will experience in our lifetime famines, food security issues, and we are actually at risk to doing that right now. As was said in my introduction, I'm originally from Germany. I can tell you in Europe, people are starting to panic because all of a sudden Russia, Ukraine, Belarus are no longer producing the normal wheat, the normal fertilizer and all of that. And that means there is a chance for food insecurity, even in places, European places, certainly in third world places. So human population is going up mainly because of increasing life expectancy. People are growing older, okay? People who used to just live 60 years in many developing countries now live 80 years. And that means more mouths to feed. This is one of my favorite photos and I think it's an important one for Uruguay. It shows a satellite image of the whole world and a circle around South Southeast Asia. This circle, ladies and gentlemen, contains more people in it than the rest of the world combined. More people live inside this circle than outside this circle. And I don't have to tell you how important this circle is for you. Right? Uruguay exports the vast majority of what you produce. A lot of that goes right into that circle. The demand will be massive and it will be sustained. And you haven't even seen what a market like China can be like. Once these people, these consumers over there, really taste the taste of beef, and not just something that's thinly sliced and drowned in sauce, but a real steak, I tell you, you have a great market there, a great market. Meat consumption is not just growing in certain areas like China, but all over uh, developing and developed countries. Here you see developing countries, uh, again, because of the bright light, you can't see everything well. But, you know, this is Middle East and North Africa. Uh, this, is, this is Southeast Asia, a very strong increase in the demand for animal source foods. Uh, South America is here in yellow. Uh, so the indicators are that, particularly in developing countries, the demand for animal source foods is very high. Unfortunately, in many developing countries, the increasing demand of animal source foods is met by growing herds by growing livestock herds. And that's not good because growing herds means, mean more methane and so on. We want to produce more by better efficiencies and so on, like you have done in Uruguay. We don't want to increase our herd numbers from 12 million here in Uruguay to 20 million. We don't want to do that. We want to produce more food with the 12 million or even fewer, but not more. And that's really important, that we need to understand the importance of production efficiencies. Now, that you really can't see. Okay, so I'll just skip over that. What's important is that there is a um, relationship between milk, out this is for, for dairy here, between milk output per cow per year on the x-axis and the carbon footprint, the greenhouse gases associated with milk production. Each little diamond here, each little diamond is one country in the world. So you see there are many countries where milk production per cow per year is very low you know, 500 kilograms per year or so, so very low. And then there are other countries where milk production per cow per year is very high. You are someplace right here. This is probably where you are, right here. So what I'm telling you is there are many, many countries where production of milk per cow per year is extremely low. So just to give you a comparison, in California where I live, a cow produces about 10 to 11 tons. So 10 to 11,000 kilos. You see how many countries there are that produce 500 kilos, 
that need 20 times the number of cows to produce the same amount of milk as one cow that we have in California. And that leads to vast herds of animals. So for example, in the entire United States, we have 9 million dairy cows, 9 million. In India, there are 300 million. India and Brazil have more cattle than the rest of the world combined. These two countries, more cattle than the rest of the world combined. And in the case of India, unfortunately, animals are extremely inefficient, producing dismal amount, tiny little amounts. And that's why the herds are so large. That's a problem. So how can we improve? How can it be that there are countries over here and there are countries over here? Well, the countries over here have done the following. They have improved reproduction of animals. They have improved the veterinary sector, so preventing diseases or treating diseases. They have improved the genetics of feed plants as well as animals, and they have learned to feed more energy-dense diets. These, this combination of factors in many developed countries has shrunk the livestock herds drastically. That, I think you are in a transformative stage right now where it's starting to happen, but in a place like the one where I live, it's, we are at the end of this process. We have drastically shrunk um, emissions of animals. We have drastically increased uh, production. So, for example, um, just to go back here a little bit, uh, on the poultry side, uh, broilers, for example, if you look at feed conversion here, has drastically reduced Mortality rate has been drastically reduced. The age these chickens live has drastically reduced from 112 days in 1920 to now 40 days and so on. The same can be shown for anything. This is pork production in the United States. It has tripled. The output has tripled, but the inputs have remained the same. On the beef side, we used to have 140 million beef cattle. Today we have 90 million. So we went from 140 to now 90 but we are producing the same amount of beef today with a much smaller herd. On the dairy side, we used to have 25 million cows. Today we have 9 million cows. But with a much smaller herd, we are producing 60% more milk. The carbon footprint of a glass of milk has shrunk by two-thirds through improved efficiencies. There are other places I spend a lot of time in China, or I used to spend a lot of time in China before COVID hit and before African swine fever hit. Um, just a really quick mentioning here. Half of, the world's, half of the world's pigs are produced in China. A staggering one billion pigs are produced in China. But what I find more amazing than that number, a billion pigs produced per year, is the fact that in China, which I consider quite a, quite a modern country these days, that in China, of these 1 million pigs, they have a 40% mortality. 40% of all pigs produced in China die pre-weaning. The pre-weaning number here, 400 million pigs, is larger than the entire United States pig crop. And that's what they lose. And that's China. Now, India or African countries are way, way, way worse than that. That is the reason, ladies and gentlemen, these inefficiencies and these production problems are the reason why the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, IPCC, says that 80%, 80% of all global greenhouse gases associated with livestock occur in the third world. 80%. And please don't misconstrue this as me saying, as me pointing fingers at others. That's not my intent. But my intent is to show that there is a vast area, uh, a potential for improvement particularly in developing countries. So, um, I have a couple more slides. One slide here that describes something that I'm asked a lot. Namely, okay, Frank, you say we, we can improve agriculture and we can reduce emissions, but shouldn't we change what we eat? In a country like the United States and many European countries, plant-based alternatives are promoted. Impossible burger, beyond meat, and so on and so on. So people ask, can production and consumption of that have a major impact? Or shall we become vegans to save the planet from climate change? Here's some numbers for that. 
if you were to be an omnivore eating everything, animals and plants, and you decide to go vegan for one, for one year, then you would reduce 0.8 tons of greenhouse gases. 0.8 tons. Now you'll ask, is that a lot or not? Let's contrast that with one single flight per passenger from North America to Europe, which generates 1.6 tons. In other words, if I fly as one passenger from the United States to Europe, then I generate twice the emissions with that flight than I would save going vegan. So I would have to go vegan for two years to offset one flight to, to Europe. And I promise you I will not do that. Okay? I just want to show you uh, how relatively dismal that impact would be. If the entire country of the United States were to go Meatless Monday, like some people promote. I heard it was promoted in Argentina recently. Going Meatless Monday. That would reduce the carbon footprint of the United States by 0.3%. That's the total impact of a Meatless Monday. If the entire United States were to go completely vegan, all 330 million North Americans, it would reduce the carbon footprint of the United States by 2.6%. That's it. It's not nothing, but certainly close to nothing. What generates 80% of our emissions in a country like the United States and most European countries is the use of fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas, by driving cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships, factories, and so on. It's not that animal agriculture doesn't have a contribution. We do have one. We know what it is, and we know how to reduce it. And if we reduce it, we can be part of a climate solution. Okay, that to me is very important to impress upon you. So, if you are interested in what the worst impact of our food system is on the environment, it's depicted on this slide. The worst impact of our entire food system on the environment is caused by the things we don't eat. 40%, 40%. of all the food grown in the United States is never eaten. 40% of all the food produced in all developing and even, sorry, in all developed, but even in all developing countries worldwide is never eaten. We are globally thrown away 40% of all food. In developed countries, that food waste occurs at the consumer level, in our kitchens and restaurants. In developing countries, the majority of the food losses occur on the field because farmers can harvest on time or transport or process the food they grow. But this number is a global number now and a number that is terrible and needs to be reduced. I think everybody would agree upon that. Except those people who want to tell the public that all we need to do is stop eating meat to save the planet. I don't believe so. I hope you don't believe that either. So with that, I want to just point out really quickly that I have a a center called the CLEAR Center. We write blogs and explainers and YouTube uh, YouTube, uh, uh, productions and so on, and you'll find it on the webpage here. And uh, with that, I come to a close, and I'm very happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, profesor Frank Milener. Ahora vamos a dar paso a las preguntas. Ignacio va a estar eh, pasando el micrófono para aquellos que quieran realizarle algunas preguntas. Tenemos algunos minutitos. No sé quién quiere empezar. Ah. Ah. Ah, aquí tenemos la presencia de su secret- del secretario de la República, Álvaro Delgado. Well, maybe while you are thinking about questions, I want to share one thing with you that that I have experienced here the last four days of being here. I think that Uruguay has huge opportunities and that Uruguay has, has taken very positive steps. 
because first of all, your efficiencies have increased, your productivity has increased. I think that's undoubtable. Secondly, you have planted a lot of forests in this country. And this afforestation has a good sink effect of greenhouse gases. A third point that I have observed is that you have a phenomenal rate of renewable energy in your energy mix. Well over 90% of all the energy you consume is from renewable sources. Let me assure you, this is not just something that's nice for the environment. This is also something that's very important for your national security. If you come from a country like I, originally from Germany, and you are dependent on fossil fuel from countries that might be a problem at times, then I tell you, you have a problem. You have taken steps at the right time that should make you very proud. On the whole climate side of things, on the energy side of things, I think that you have a very good story to tell. You're in a good position and you need to continue on that, on that path. And I congratulate you on this and I think that you should be proud of what you have accomplished and keep going. Just keep going and make sure your agricultural se sector is not left behind. That your agricultural sector can also contribute to the success story. And then don't forget this. My father always said to me the following thing. He said to me, Frank, do good things and talk about them. And here you need to do better because you keep all of that a very well-kept secret. You need to tell the world about that. You need to tell the world what you do because you are moving in the right direction, but most of the world doesn't know it. So other countries are more outspoken you are less outspoken, but maybe you need to consider that. Telling your story is very important. Bueno, dado que no hay que romper el hielo, voy a hacer una primera pregunta, Frank. El, el argumento que tú usas es relativamente simple y es sorprendentemente simple, que es el metano es una molécula inestable, se destruye en 10 años o 12 y el CO2 dura mil años. O sea, parece muy lógico y muy simple desde el punto de vista físico-químico. Suponemos que hay una buena ciencia que demuestra eso. ¿Por qué crees tú que el panel intergubernamental, el IPCC, ¿no? intergubernamental de, de cambio climático, ha demorado tanto tiempo en reconocer que es un ciclo que se destruye y que cicla y que si uno tiene una fuente estable de metano no contribuye. O sea, ¿por qué si la ciencia parece ser relativamente simple o clara? So, the issue is that, as I said, methane is a potent greenhouse gas. But the question that we have or should have is not necessarily, is not necessarily one of, I get strangled here. <laughs> The question is not so much one of how, how much emissions are produced, but what these emissions do to warming, okay? What they do to warming. If we want to know what a gas does to warming, then we need to see what the changes over time are. So if you had emissions of methane here, and over time you go here, then that means you now have fewer emissions, and that means you have pulled carbon out of the air. And if you pull carbon out of the air, then that reduces warming. The way that was quantified in the past does not characterize for the dynamic of particularly methane on warming. In my opinion, and many of my colleagues share that opinion, if you want to characterize the impact of a gas on warming, then you need to have a unit that's fit for purpose to describe the impact on warming. And thankfully, there, there are now units that do that. But there's a lot of what we call inertia. Okay, we have done things the same way for the last 30 years. It takes a while to change people's mind and get them to accept that science progresses, that it advances. Science is advancing, and in the case of methane, I think it works very much in favor to those in agriculture who understand that methane is an opportunity. If we keep it stable or reduce it, then it's not part of a problem. It can be part of a solution. Sí, 
Eh, quiero hacer una pregunta en relación a los incentivos que tienen en Estados Unidos, en, en California. ¿También son extensivos a, a los feedlots? En ese caso, ¿También hacen más o menos programas parecidos para disminuir la, la presión de producción de metano? Y, ¿Y en Europa hay experiencias en ese sentido, también tanto con la producción lechera como con la producción de, de carne intensiva? Sí, yeah, so, um, currently for now, because this whole California um, credit, carbon crediting has really started a few years ago, uh, currently it includes only manure management, manure management. It does not currently include enteric emissions, which means the belching, to reduce the belching of animals. Um, when you reduce methane from manure storages and you convert that methane into transportation fuels, then you will receive credits. They are called low carbon fuel standard credits. These credits are very high. That means a lot of money. If the average dairy cow in California makes the farm of $4,000 for the sales of milk every year, then the biogas to fuel conversion I just talked about per cow makes about $2,000. So almost half the amount of money is gained through the biogas to fuel conversion, as is the milk. So you can imagine our farmers now say, this is a no-brainer. Of course I need to do this. Why would I just have my manure off gas into the air and lose the methane when I could convert the methane and make it into fuel and make money with it? So this is happening, and this will continue to happen. Within the next three years, I believe at least half of the approximately two million dairy cows in California will produce manure that will eventually generate transportation fuel. At least half. The government is very much behind that. The public really likes it because most of the public understands we all need food. We want farmers to be at the table. We want farmers to be part of a solution. Farmers are not the problem, okay? They are producing the food we all need, and if they can also produce fuel that we all need, bueno. So in Europe, I'm not sure. I, I don't know yet what the different markets are in Europe, but I can tell you this. This California example has caught on in the United States. Other states in the United States are now doing the same thing. Eh, gracias. Eh, muy ilustrativa su, su charla. Eh, mi pregunta es, Uruguay produce la mayor parte de la carne y de la leche en, a pastoreo, a campo, eh, a cielo abierto. Eh, sabemos que el manejo adecuado del rodeo y de la pastura puede mejorar la, la cantidad de materia orgánica en los suelos. Creemos, o al menos yo pienso eso, que eh, es una muy buena forma de capturar el carbono ese que está sobrando en la atmósfera. Y la otra pregunta es el caso de los biocombustibles. El hecho de usar biocombustibles procedentes de la de la materia orgánica producida sobre, por la agricultura, si eso también puede ser eh, mecanismos de reducción de la emisión de carbono. Sí, yeah, so, um, to your first question. Um, the situation you are in with respect to reducing greenhouse gases from animal agriculture is a tough one because your animals, in contrast to our animals, let's say in California, the rest of the United States, are mainly on pasture. So you don't have access to those animals every day. You don't feed them, they feed themselves. You don't collect their manure, they just drop it and it falls off on the field. So that means you have less of the opportunity of feeding, for example, feed additives, feed additives that reduce methane you don't really have the opportunity of collecting a lot of gas from manure storages. 
right? At least most people don't. If you have a dairy and you collect your manure, you can do the same thing as I just described. If you feed your cows yourself, there are feed additives that reduce methane. But under your conditions, the best way for now is to increase soil carbon sequestration, and you described that. That's one. The second one is to improve other production parameters. For example, if in the past, let's say beef animals lived five years, and then you improved, let's say, forage, or you improved reproduction or so, and now the animals don't live five years, they now live three and a half years before they go to slaughter, then that means you have saved one and a half years of this animal life. That means it has eaten one and a half years less and had one and a half years less water to drink and belched one and a half years less and so on and so on. It reduces the environmental footprint if and when you increase the performance of those animals. And that is what you have already been doing. Your cattle herd is stable, but your productivity has gone up. When productivity goes up, environmental footprint goes down, just like with your car. When you buy a car that's more fuel efficient than the old car, then more fuel efficient means you can drive the same distance with the new versus old car. But the new car needs fewer gas to get from one place to another, and with it, fewer emissions. The same thing as fuel efficiency occurs in feed efficiency and in our livestock systems. And I think you have room to grow on forage management, on reproductive management. Reproductive rate is a, is a big deal here, I understand. Um, and so there are defini definitely different ways you can improve performance and productivity and therefore reduce emission intensity. And uh, what was the second part of your question? What was the second part? And the second one was related to uh, converting uh, agricultural products into biofuels and so on. And here the question is, what kind of biofuels do you produce? If you go a pathway like the one I showed you from biogas to transportation, then you might end up producing the most carbon negative fuel type there is. El, et, la producción de etanol y la producción de biodiesel que se estaba incorporando a los eh, combustibles fósiles. Yeah. So, uh, ethanol and biodiesel are a different story, okay? I'm not uh, well versed on this, but what I can tell you is when I see ethanol from corn or from sugarcane and the environmental footprint of that versus the environmental footprint of regular gas, regular gasoline, then I have seen some data that didn't really show a big difference. Okay. So it's not my area of expertise, so I will not comment on this any further, but I know there's a lot of criticism. In the United States, 40%, 40% of all corn is made into corn ethanol and burned in our vehicles as gas. 40%. There's now a lot of criticism mounting whether or not that's a good use of uh, food growing areas. That's just, that's, I, I just state that as, you know, in general, that's, uh, that's viewed as critical by many, except for the people growing the corn. La solución de pasar el biogás eh, que se genera tanto en los tambos como también le voy a poner acá a tratamiento de aguas residuales de industrias que generan importante cantidad de metano. Eh, aquí tenemos el problema de que no hay una infraestructura, no hay una cultura en eso y cada uno tiene que hacer su propia inversión para aprovechar ese biogás. En California, ¿cómo resuelven...? a nivel de un mercado, digamos, de biocombustible, el tema. ¿Se puede vender el biogás eh, en bruto? Eh, ¿Hay una logística? So, 
First of all, what I showed you uh, on this slide is a large dairy with 1,000 or a dairy with 1,500 cows, and the manure storage is now covered, and that produces a lot of biogas. Okay, so that biogas has to be cleaned up first from other impurities, and then it can be sold to vehicles and directly fuel vehicles like semi trucks and buses. There's a market for that, and it's a very good market for that. And if you do it, not just can you sell the, bio the, the renewable natural gas that results, but you also get credits, very large credits, the so-called low-carbon fuel standard credits. So while that system works for California, it doesn't work in other places yet if there are no policies set. It's very important if a country like Uruguay were to go such a route to financially incentivize farmers to reduce methane, then you need to have policies in place. But don't think that you always have to wait for the government. We now have many situations where private business is working with agriculture, where companies such as Nestle or Starbucks, large companies, multi, I mean, billion dollar companies, are incentivizing farmers financially. They give farmers money to reduce methane. Why? Because when the supply chain farmers reduce their methane, then the big companies can say our carbon footprint is now lower. I have seen it happening many times now. I've also seen situations where companies that are fossil fuel users like Shell, producers and users like Shell and Exxon and car companies like BMW and so on, that they go and buy credits from farmers, give the farmer money and say, you give us credits, we give you money. So the markets are developing now. And the question is, do you want to have some kind of market mechanism yourself in your country? Because without financial incentives, none of what I said will work. If you don't put a price to the reduction of environmental pollutants, it's very difficult to achieve that. And most people who are in this field would agree. So you have to have a market. And the country should say, we have an interest in reducing our carbon footprint. We help those players that can do it, and that's farmers, for example. But for them to do it, uh, that costs money. The farmers will not be able to pay that bill themselves. Eventually, our farmers now make much more money than they ever invested. Even though those investments are high, after two or three years, they break even financially. And then they make additional income. I see some real opportunities for the agricultural sector. Not just environmentally, but also financially. Hola, hola. Eh, sí, eh, buenos días. Muy, gracias por la presentación. Una pregunta. Eh, en Uruguay está habiendo un par de eh, emprendimientos que están eh, comercializando carne con sello de carbono neutro. Quería saber si los conocía, si le parece que ese es el, eh, uno de los caminos a recorrer y, y si es una práctica que se está generalizando a nivel mundial. So, we are currently in a situation where there is a lot of uncertainty about how to quantify things such as methane, okay? It's not a settled discussion. There is still controversy as to how to quantify different gases and how to measure them and so forth. So if you look at four or five different companies that validate carbon footprints and so on, they, they might use very different methodologies. Okay? So there are lots of question marks behind the claims that some people make. But what I can tell you is if on the one side you sequester carbon and store it with soils and plants. On the other side, you reduce particularly methane, then the prospect of becoming climate neutral is real. And climate neutral means that you will no longer cause additional warming. And if you go even beyond that, then you become carbon negative, and that means you are now pulling carbon from the air, and you can sell those credits to those that need them, fossil fuel companies. This is happening. I'm working as we speak with the California dairy industry 
on showing them what they need to do to become climate neutral. And with these reductions, with these strong reductions of methane, they will get there very fast, very fast. You just first of all need to get a mindset of where are we now? Where do we want to go? And how do we get there? And how do we get there? So individual companies, I think right now have, uh, are ambitious and it's important to be ambitious, but it's very difficult to verify whether what they say is true. So this will take a while. It's a brand new, it's a brand new scenario. Muchas gracias a todos por las preguntas. Muchas gracias a nuestro expositor Frank Milaner. Eh, quiero agradecer por, por toda la semana que tuvimos. Eh, fue una agenda muy intensa. Eh, nos hemos juntado con ministros, con técnicos del Grupo de la Huella Ambiental, luego también con investigadores de la academia, una actividad junto a Ani. ¿sí? Y bueno, y hoy en la tarde también estaría visitando a Inia para finalizar lo que fue esta semana de tener el honor de, de contar con la presencia de Frank Milenar en Uruguay. A su vez, antes de terminar, quiero, eh, queremos invitarlos a, vamos a tener un brindis con, con una parrilla, así que los invitamos a, a quedarse y a la prensa que si quiere hacerle alguna nota a... Um... Ah, sí. Sí, claro, claro, señor ministro. Una pregunta que va direccionada con la realidad que vivimos hoy, un poco controversial con el tema del valor de los commodities, de la energía y de la guerra en Europa, que usted la debe acompañar y sentir muy de cerca porque de su ciudad de origen a pocos kilómetros están estallando las bombas y hay una, una crisis humanitaria asociada. Nosotros... Hace más de 20 años que estamos negociando un acuerdo de libre comercio Mercosur-Unión Europea. Y este acuerdo no ha avanzado por una cantidad de requerimientos o de reglas de protección ambiental que Europa le exige al Mercosur que imponga. Eso también tiene un aspecto de que nos ponen a todos en la misma bolsa y no somos todos iguales en el MERCOSUR. Pero la realidad es que esta exigencia de carácter ambiental que está muy influenciada por una influencia política de los partidos verdes en Europa, muy intensa, eh, encierra al final una especie de contradicción, porque usted como alemán sabe que Alemania quedó muy dependiente de la energía rusa y que hoy como forma de compensación, se generaron dos medidas muy sorprendentes. Una, intensificar la generación de energía a través del carbón, es decir, el carbón mineral, que es de los aspectos más contaminantes que hay para la atmósfera. Y por otro lado, la reciente autorización de mi colega, ministro alemán, que además de vegano, que no es una mala condición, es una decisión de él, pero además de eso, eh, es verde, recién autoriza la plantación en tierras de protección ambiental, de reserva ambiental. Es decir, tal la necesidad que existe de generar mayor producción, que no solo Alemania, pero Francia también ha, tomas, ha tomado la misma medida, de forma que aquellos parámetros de defensa de los aspectos ambientales, cuando existe una necesidad, ya no son tales. Entonces esto encierra una especie de contradicción e hipocresía de carácter político internacional, como hemos visto tantas veces cuando se pretenden imponer reglas que después esos principios en función de la necesidad pasan a segundo plano. Entonces todo este aspecto internacional y como usted al mismo tiempo es de origen alemán y vive en Estados Unidos, nos gustaría bien una reflexión de este momento que estamos viviendo, lo saco un poco de tema, pero tiene que ver con muchos de estos temas de su propia especialidad. Yeah, you are absolutely right. I am very concerned about what's happening these days. I would have never thought, or I had hoped I would never experience a situation where Europe would get into another major war. Um, you might think of this just being a war between two countries, but Europeans don't feel that way. 
those people in, uh, in the Baltics or Poland, they feel they could be next. Um, so the security situation in Europe is fragile right now, okay? And all these countries like Germany and others, they felt there is just no problem anymore with respect to security. And all of a sudden they feel, oh my gosh, there's a problem. Germany has 300 tanks left, 300 tanks and 200 fighter planes. They thought they never need tanks again. And now they're waking up saying, oh my gosh, we need thousands of tanks. They will all invest into rearmament, guaranteed. Guar we will see a new race for weapons in Europe and other parts of the world. We will see a reprioritization with respect to goals that countries have. Just five months ago, the world was focusing on what I just talked, talked about climate, you know, uh, biodiversity and all these things. And then you have something like a war happening and all of a sudden it's no longer numero uno. Something else is now numero uno, namely, uh, you know, to make sure that you are not threatened to do something you don't want to do, that somebody is not putting a gun on your head, that somebody is not in a situation where you're so dependent on them that they can just turn off, they can just turn off the gas and you have nothing, nothing left, okay? So the priorities change at an amazing speed, amazing speed. But I'm a scientist at a university, I'm specialized in a certain topic, I'm not a politician, so I have to concentrate on what I do and concentrate on helping farmers to reduce their environmental footprint. To me, priorities don't change. My priority is to work with farmers to improve what they do. But I'm very clear as to what the overall priorities in life are. To live in peace, to live in a way where we are well nourished, where we can make free decisions about how we live our lives, who our friends are, whether or not we can speak openly to each other or have to be scared. I'm very clear about my priorities. I'm very clear about that. So you are kind of far away from what's happening over there, okay? You are really kind of far away from it. But your European friends are very worried, very worried right now. I also want to tell you one last thing. When I think of Uruguay, I think of all this extensive agriculture, right? And some people are critical of that. They say, well, we should be more intensive and so on. No, I think that you are making the best use of your natural resources you're making the best use of your natural resources, many of which are marginal lands. Using ruminants on these lands is a very good thing. And you are supplying much of the rest of the world with food that they seek to have. 70% of the food you grow goes into other countries. Make sure, make sure that in international trade agreements and so on, international climate agreements, you get a fair shake, a fair shake. I'll give you one last example. Because it bothers me so much. It is referred to as territorial emissions. Territorial emissions, what does that mean? It means that emissions of a country are accounted to where the emissions occur. So for example, Norway is a very rich country and Norway produces a lot of fossil fuels, oil, coal and gas. And the vast majority of the fossil fuels they produce, they export into the rest of the world. Because these fossil fuels are then burned in the rest of the world, Norway is not blamed for it. They are producing the fossil fuels, but they are selling it into the rest of the world. They are not blamed for those carbon emissions associated with all that fossil fuel. Uruguay does not produce fossil fuel, but Uruguay produces food and exports 70% into other countries. Those who import your food are not blamed for those carbon emissions. You are, because the international agreements say that the farm is where the emissions develop. So you are blamed for that carbon footprint. It's called territorial emissions. If you live in a country like Saudi Arabia and you export all of your fossil fuels and you import all of your food, then you look clean as a whistle. And you tell me that that's fair. 
If I were Uruguayan, if I were in a, in a position of power in Uruguay, I would definitely look into that. As well as if I were in Ireland or in New Zealand, in countries that export as much as you do. What you do is not just important to this country. What you do is also important for the food security in other parts of the world. And it's important that you're not overburdened, not overburdened with, uh, with, with liabilities that really should be spread across. That's my opinion. Muchas gracias, profesor Frank Milener. Muchas gracias a todos por venir.